technology. But yeah, just uh, up and down, and then you can, you can. Uh, right. The full title is Berryology Using Vernier Interpolation. That was the right. right. Okay, great. Uh, yes, so um, uh, exactly I'll be talking about Berryology Using Vernier Interpolation. And what I th thought I would do is divide the talk in two parts. So in the first part, I will give you a feeling for uh, some of the physical effects where Berry phase type quantities appear, and I will focus on optical effects and transport effects. Um, and in the second part, then, I will uh, try to tell you a little bit about how, in practice, we use Vani functions in the sense that David was just mentioning as a tool to uh, calculate uh, such uh, physical responses for physical, for, for real materials. Okay, uh, I guess uh, you already saw my little joke there, but so this, this was an idea of Stefan Tsirkin. He told me, uh, why don't you go to a search engine and type baryology to see what comes out? So I did that, and this is what appeared. So something to do with the berries and the Mediterranean diet. So clearly we are in the right country to talk about berryology, so that's great. But uh, yeah, we'll talk about different types of berries and I will choose two to focus on this talk, which is the berry connection, uh, which is uh, for, so in David's talk, the berry connection was uh, defined mostly by taking a cell periodic block state and taking the inner product of that block state in band N with its gradient, and again, band N. I'll do a slight generalization where the bra and the cat have different band indices, and so it's now a matrix in the band indices at every K point. And I will argue that this quantity appears very naturally in the description of optical properties. And then the Berry curvature, is defined by taking the band diagonal elements of this Berry connection matrix and then taking another derivative, so taking its curl, and so it's a property of a single band, and again as a function of k, and I will uh, show you, actually David already did it, but uh, a bit more about how this quantity appears in the description of transport. Okay, so let's start with optics. And let's remember the basics that we learn in undergraduate quantum mechanics in atomic physics. So we start with a two-level system, and let's focus on two levels, which I label N and L, with energy En and El. And we come with a light whose frequency is precisely the difference between these energies. So we're going to optically excite an electron from the lower to the upper state and let's say that the light has polarization along some Cartesian direction A. So the, one of the basic quantities that we learn about is the oscillator strength that uh, tells you the strength of this transition. And uh, uh, what the formula looks like is there is some prefactor containing the energy difference, omega Ln, and then there is a matrix element of the position operator R along the polarization of light between the two states, and then, that's, and then you take the magnitude squared of that. Now, you remember from David's talk that uh, uh, the velocity operator can be defined as the commutator of the coordinate operator with the Hamiltonian, and if you do that, uh, you can rewrite the oscillator strength as shown here in the second line. So it's actually easier to go from the second to the first by writing V as the commutator of R and H. What did I do? Are we still on Zoom? Hmm. Uh, it says connecting on my screen. I don't know if I... Back? <laughs> 
think maybe we might have if you if you do multiple fingers you can switch to a different screen so you don't want to do that you want to do just one yeah, finger thank you. yes thanks okay sorry about that um, okay so the point of this little derivation was just to uh, uh, to tell you that to calculate optical transitions, one way of doing it is to uh, evaluate matrix elements of the velocity operator. So that was for atoms. Uh, now I cannot scroll. Yeah. No, it works. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So now if you are in a crystal, uh, of course, the energy levels are uh, uh, organized into bands, but we have pretty much the same situation where now your state, your, your initial state is a state in a valence band N, and your final state is in some connection band L, and uh, you want to ev evaluate the oscillator strength, and of course the states are block states, so a plane wave with uh, a cell periodic part. And I would like to spend a little time in this derivation just to, to show you how the Berry connection appears. So we take the matrix element of the velocity operator between the block states L and N. And we're going to write the velocity as the commutator of R and H. That's the first line. Now, to go this, to the second line, uh, what we do is we plug this formula for psi as a plane wave times u, and I'm going to absorb these phase factors into the definition of h of k. Basically, k is times i k r h e to the plus i k r. Okay, so what we have is still a commutator of R with this H of K, and you can easily con uh, convince yourselves that if we differentiate this formula here with respect to K, so my notation is that dA is just a shorthand for D for a partial derivative with respect to the A component of the wave vector. So if you just differentiate this expression here, you get the commutator, right? Okay, so that's to, to go from the second to the third line. And the final step to go from the third to the fourth uh, is another little trick, which is you take this equation So these are block eigenstates, so they are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So this matrix has this form, and we're just going to take the derivative with respect to Ka of this entire equation. Okay. So you're going to get a bunch of terms, but uh, one of them is the one that appears in the third line, which is the one where the derivative acts here. right? Then you're going to have another term where it acts here, another term where it acts there, and then also it acts uh, over there. Anyway, you collect the terms in the right form, uh, you solve for the one you want in the third line, and what you get is that you get two terms. One contains the derivative of the energy eigenvalue, and then it has a delta function, so it vanishes if the bands are different. That's the intraband velocity, so the band gradient, which we all know about. And then, uh, in, conversely, if L is different from N, that term va vanishes, but then we have the other term, which actually contains the Berry connection. And the way you see that is that, for example, when you act with the derivative on uh, this cat here, then you're still left with the Hamiltonian that can act on the bra, and it pulls out an energy eigenvalue. And then, conversely, when you act with the derivative here, you get the energy eigenvalue of the other state, uh, and you organize them into a difference. Yes? 
Right, so uh, the intraband part is basically like the Hellman Feynman theorem. I'm basically deriving, if you want, the Hellman Feynman theorem. Yeah. Well, I don't think we made any assumptions apart from the states being eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So this is just straightforward manipulations. But that's sort of how you, de you derive the Hellman Feynman theorem. Yeah. So if you go back to our diagram, we were interested in interband transitions. So this first term, which is intraband, doesn't really play any role. But you see that to evaluate the velocity matrix elements that we wanted, they basically involve the Berry connection. So that was sort of what I wanted to motivate, that it's a very natural quantity that appears in the description of optical transitions. And uh, by the way, um, it appears multiplied by this omega ln. So when you plug it there, since it's squared, the omega ln will go to the numerator. So actually, the Berry connection matrix itself is basically the matrix elements of the position operator between different b block states in different bands. So it's kind of like an interband dipole matrix element. Okay? So when you write uh, some, an optical response like the dielectric function and you focus on the interband part, it's then very natural that the formulas that you obtain involved off diagonal elements of the Berry connection, as shown here for the dielectric function. So there is here an F and L, which is just the difference between the Fermi occupation factors of the two bands. And so this is the kind of quantity that we want to evaluate to calculate within band theory the dielectric function of some material. I will flash very quickly a, a slightly more complicated example. You don't have to understand everything, but it's just to give you the feeling that when you go to, for example, nonlinear optical responses, so this is now a current that is second order in a frequency dependent electric field. So things get a bit more complicated. Of course, you have more indices, the formulas get a bit longer, but the basic building blocks are still the same. So you need energy eigenvalues to get the energy conservation. You get the Berry connection for the oscillator strength. And in this nonlinear response, you get uh, the second Berry connection that appeared here in the linear response. In the nonlinear response, becomes kind of a K derivative of the Berry connection matrix. It's actually what's called a covariant K derivative. What that means is that if you only had the first term, it would not be well behaved under gauge transformations. But when you add uh, this difference between band diagonal Berry connections, uh, the entire object is now well behaved, and, uh, and then the physical response is gauge invariant, which should be uh, to be physically measurable. But so basically, uh, it's again all about Berry connection type quantities. OK, so that was the examples I wanted to give about optics. Let's now switch to transport and, and see how the Berry curvature appears. So uh, David mentioned in responding to one of the questions this semi-classical picture of Cheng Niu's group where you create a wave packet in some band. So by the way, here I'm focusing on a single band, so I remove the band index. So we have some band, wave packet somewhere in the band that is well localized in K space, but also somewhat localized in real space. So we can define its average position in real space R an average position K in reciprocal space, and we apply electric and magnetic fields. So the total force, electric force and Lorentz force, gives you the change in K, the rate of change in K. And the total velocity in real space of the wave packet has two terms. One is the band velocity, and the second one is K dot cross the Berry curvature. And that term looks very similar to the Lorentz force, you replace R dot by K dot, and you replace the magnetic field by the Berry curvature. So the Berry curvature is a kind of a magnetic field in reciprocal space, if you want. So for the rest of this talk, I will set to zero the real magnetic field. So I will talk about transport in response to just electric fields. So we cancel out that term, and we replace the expression that remains for K dot uh, in the first line here, 
and we get this expression for the velocity. So there is the bend velocity, and then there is a second term, which is known as the anomalous velocity. By the way, here the Berry curvature was a vector, and here I've rewritten it as a second rank tensor. So in three dimensions, a vector has three components, but an anti-symmetric tensor has three independent components, so we can repackage the vector as, uh, as an anti-symmetric tensor. So omega AB equals minus omega B. Okay, so that's one ingredient we need to calculate the current. So to get the total current in the crystal, what we do is we add, we add up the contributions from the wave packets everywhere in the band, but the band may be partially occupied, so we need to only add up up to the uh, Fermi level, so we need to multiply by a Fermi occupation factor. So to get the current, we plug this expression here for R dot into this formula here, and we still need an expression for the distribution function, and uh, solving the Boltzmann transport equation to linear order in the electric field, we get this expression here. So F, the, uh, F prime is the FDE. And V there is the band velocity, so the band gradient. So we insert R dot here and F there. And by the way, these are just leading terms in an expansion in the electric field, but uh, we stay at low order. So we collect terms to linear order in the field and that gives us the linear conductivity. And we collect terms to second order in the field and that gets us the first nonlinear conductivity that has three indices. So the linear conductivity has two terms. One is we take the band velocity unperturbed by the electric field and we multiply it by the distribution function at first order in the field. So that gives us a product of two band velocities and uh, F prime. And then there is another first order contribution which is you take the velocity corrected to first order in the field, that's the anomalous velocity, and we multiply it by the unperturbed distribution function and that gives us this second term here. So notice that the first term is symmetric in the Cartesian indices A and B, so that's the usual textbook ohmic conductivity. The second one, as I told you before, the Berry curvature written as a second rank tensor was anti-symmetric, so that gives you an anti-symmetric or whole uh, conductivity. So that is the linear conductivity. To second order in the electric field, in the expression I wrote, there is only one term, which is the anomalous velocity that picks up one E here, and the first order distribution function that picks another E over there. Uh, so we get uh, basically the Berry curvature multiplied by the velocity and uh, the distribution function F prime. I'm going to do a little... Uh, manipulation here, which is to say that I'm going to write Vc F0 prime as 1 over bar Vc and F0 Be. That's what the prime means. So there is basically a, a chain rule here. I can write that as 1 over A bar Bf0, Bkc. And then I can do an integration by parts and transfer the derivative to the Berry curvature. And I get the expression here in the second line. So to summarize, uh, focusing now just on the whole parts of the responses highlighted in yellow, we have a linear Hall effect that is given by the integral of the Berry curvature over the occupied states. And uh, at second order in the electric field, we have a nonlinear Hall effect that is given by, again, summing up over the occupied states, not the Berry curvature itself, but its gradient. And these are called anomalous Hall effects in the sense that David explained that they occur at zero magnetic fields. So remember early on, I crossed out the magnetic fields everywhere. So they are anomalous because the usual Hall effect, of course, requires uh, a magnetic field. Okay, let me talk a bit about uh, symmetry. Um, 
to understand under which conditions the linear and the nonlinear anomalous effect can occur. So if you have time reversal symmetry, the energy bands are the same at uh, k and minus k, and the Berry curvature is equal and opposite at k and minus k. So that means that when you do this integral, you're going to pick up equal and opposite contribution from k and minus k that uh, cancel out, and so the net integral is going to be zero. Because, of course, if a state is occupied at point k, since the energy is the same at minus k, it will also be occupied, but the Berry curvature will be opposite. Uh, regarding the nonlinear Hall effect, the situation is the following. So let's consider the effect of inversion symmetry. Again, the energy bands are even uh, under k, but now the Berry curvature is also even. So if the Berry curvature is an even function of k, its gradient is going to be an odd function. And so, again, there's going to be a cancellation between k and minus k when you do this integral with inversion symmetry. So the conclusion is that to get a linear anomalous Hall effect, we need a system that breaks time reversal symmetry. And to get a nonlinear anomalous Hall effect, the system should break inversion symmetry to guarantee that the required integrals are non-zero. By the way, if the system breaks both symmetries, but it has the, comp the combined symmetry of time reversal and inversion, the combination of these two conditions means that the Berry curvature vanishes everywhere in the Bruno zone, and in that case, both the linear and the nonlinear anomalous Hall effects vanish. Okay, so here are some pictures. I'm going to focus on a two-dimensional system on the left-hand side, it's a magnetic system with magnetization out of the plane, and the Berry curvature is now a scalar or a pseudo-scalar that also points out of the plane. And uh, in a system that breaks time reversal symmetry, the Berry curvature has this kind of profile. So in this case, it's mostly negative, but it's, it has basically uh, the same sign, let's say, in most of the Brillouin zone, in such a way that when we integrate over the occupied states, we get a non-zero value. So this, the experimental setup is that you apply a voltage along x, for example, and because of this Berry curvature vector pointing out of the sample along z, you're going to have a transverse current along y. In the case of the nonlinear anomalous Hall effect, now on the right side, the system is non-magnetic, but uh, uh, it breaks inversion symmetry. So because it's non-magnetic, the net Berry curvature in some bands is zero, so there is equal amount of blue and red, so blue is negative, red is positive. But because it breaks inversion symmetry locally at a given point in k-space, the Berry curvature is non-zero. And so in this case, it's negative on the left, positive on the right, so there is going to be a kind of a dipole indicated by this uh, pink arrow, which is precisely this gradient quantity that I wrote before that describes the nonlinear anomalous Hall effect. So the geometry here is that if you apply an electric field along the direction of this pink arrow, let's say along x, you're going to have a whole current at second order in the field along y. OK. So that is the survey I wanted to do about the effects that we are interested in. And to summarize, for optics, we need energy eigenvalues and off-diagonal elements of the Berry connection. And for transport, we need the eigenvalues and their gradients, the band velocities, and also the Berry curvature. And when you go to nonlinear responses, then you may need further derivatives of such quantities, such as, for example, the gradient of the Berry curvature. And uh, what I would like to explain in the second half of the talk is how Vanier interpolation is a very convenient tool for calculating such quantities. So the setting we have in mind here is what uh, David was mentioning in response to the last question. We have some system with several bands, and we're going to vanierize, like you did in the tutorial yesterday, a few of those bands that, con that where the action is taking place. So if it's an interband transition, we want to include the initial and final band within our energy window. If it's transport, we want to make sure that the Fermi level is in this inner window so that the Fermi surface is very well described. And then uh, we want to evaluate these kinds of quantities. So 
so we have our Vani functions. I'm using this notation where capital R is the cell, uh, the lattice vector of the cell, and J labels the Vani functions in the cell. And then we're going to define a block basis function by doing this kind of Fourier sum. And by the way, I'm going to use a slightly different phase convention to the one that you've seen in all the talks so far. Uh, there was not this tau j here in the similar formulas you've seen before in previous talks. This is just a pure matter of convention. What this tau j is, is the center of the Vani function j uh, in the home unit cell zero. Um, the reason I want to do this will be uh, will become clear later on, but bear in mind that this is just a choice that you can make. So Vanier 90 does not include this tau j in the Fourier sums. Uh, Python type binding does, for example, uh, but okay, I'll come back to that later. So we have our block basis functions that span the Vanierized bands and we uh, set up at any given k the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian between different block basis states and we get this uh, Fourier sum expression where on the right hand side we have the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian between uh, the Vani functions. Okay, so uh, we do this uh, Fourier sum at a given k point and we get a small matrix uh, n by n where n is the number of Vani functions in, uh, per unit cell and we diagonalize the, that matrix with some unitary matrix U, and the eigenvalues are the interpolated energy bands. So when we plotted yesterday in the tutorial some energy bands, that's all that the code did, very simple. And remember, these are small matrices because we only vanierize a relatively small number of bands, so this can all be done very quickly uh, across the Brillouin zone. Okay. So this is nothing but uh, orthogonal tight binding using the Vani functions as the basis orbitals. And once you've tabulated these real space matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in the Vani basis, so they are the on-site energies and the hoppings, we can reuse them at every k point uh, uh, to evaluate the energy bands. Okay, so the basic uh, workflow uh, is that we perform the ab initio calculation on the coarse ab initio mesh, that was the NSCF step in yesterday's uh, tutorial. Uh, let's say, for example, a four by four by four mesh. We use that as an input for Vani 90 to get our Vani functions. Then we set up these Hamiltonian matrix elements. We store them, and then we Fourier transform back to a dense mesh of K points to uh, do the things we want, like the energy bands, and I'll show you later how to do the more complicated quantities like the Berry connection. Okay, let me, however, before doing that, show you uh, just an example. This is a work uh, we did recently with Yulan Ibanez, Aspiros, and uh, Fernando de Juan. So this is a 2D material, it's kind of like graphene, but uh, some of the chains are pure carbon chains, and then they are uh, uh, interleaved with boron nitride chains. Uh, and uh, what I'm showing you here in this figure is the hopping matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in the Vanier basis. So what we did here, we, we chose a, a Vanier basis where there is one PZ orbital on each atom. And uh, what you see is that because the Vanier functions are exponentially localized, these hopping matrix elements are very short range, so they are only large between Vani functions that are near to each other. And as you move far, uh, further apart, then they very quickly drop down to zero because of the exponential localization. So that means that in those Fourier sums, you only need to keep just a few near neighbors uh, hoppings to, uh, to get accurate results for the interpolated energy bands showed, shown in red here. So that's also related to what Jonathan Yates was showing yesterday, that uh, uh, the accuracy of the interpolation uh, was uh, exponential uh, in the number of K points, because the number of K points in the initial mesh tells you how many Vani functions you have in your supercell, so how many of these neighbors you can keep. So in the end, you don't need that many because 
when you are here, you can include them, but they don't contribute anything. So the accuracy just converges exponentially fast. Okay, so um, as I said before, this is basically tight binding in the Vanier basis, and these uh, matrices U that diagonalize the Hamiltonian, uh, I want to think of the columns of those matrices U as the tight binding eigenvectors. And uh, the next thing I want to do is starting from the block basis states, which were these psi's with the W superscript, I want to rotate them using the same matrix U that diagonalized the Hamiltonian, and those will be my Vanier interpolated block eigenstates. And the reason I want to do that is that later on we want to calculate things like Berry curvatures and Berry connections, which are properties of the wave functions. So we need to have the Vanier interpolated wave functions themselves to calculate these kinds of uh, wave function derived quantities. But before doing that, I just want to do a, a couple of steps of algebra that I will need for what will come up next. So bear with me for a little bit. So uh, this is the same equation I wrote before, the one that we used to interpolate the energy bands. But now I want to think of these columns of the U matrix as states, so the tight binding eigenstates. So in that notation, I can rewrite this equation in a kind of a Dirac funny Dirac notation with double uh, lines, which I use to distinguish from the true Dirac notation for the true block eigenstates. So this is just a regular looking matrix element of the tight binding Hamiltonian between two tight binding states. And since they are eigenstates, this is a diagonal matrix. And what I want to do next is precisely what I did here. I did before for the true eigenstates. I want to repeat the same algebra for the tight binding states. And I want to do that just for off-diagonal matrix elements. And I will go very quickly here because it's the same that I did before. But I just want to introduce a little bit of notation that will be used in what follows. I will introduce a matrix D, dagger, has a Cartesian index A, and it has U dagger, K derivative of U. So this is a matrix, so it has two band indices L and N, like so. And in my condensed uh, tight binding cat notation, this would be just L okay. So you see that this looks a lot like the Berry connection. It's only missing an I, but it's kind of a Berry connection for the tight binding states, as opposed to the Berry connection for the real ab initio or Vani interpolated block eigenstates. And uh, okay. And by the way, so what we need here to evaluate this D matrix is just sandwiched between U dagger and U, which we already have, the gradient of the tight binding Hamiltonian H of W. And that's very simple because remember that H of W was just as Fourier sum. And we want to take a K derivative, but K only appears in the exponential. So we only take the, the exponent down when we take the derivative. So this is very simple to evaluate. And again, these are all small matrices. Okay, so to define things like Berry connections and Berry curvatures, we want the cell periodic block eigenstates. So they are defined uh, in the same way, the Vani interpolated ones, uh, just by rotating the, uh, the, the ones with the W subs, uh, superscripts with the U matrix. And those are given here. And so now we can proceed and evaluate things like the Berry connection and Berry curvature. So let me start with the Berry connection. So that was the definition. And we want to take the gradient in K of the cat, right? Which has the band index N. So remember from the previous slide that the state was given by this first equation here. So it, has, uh, it is rotated by this U matrix. So now, now we want to take the K derivative of that. 
So the derivative is going to act on two places. It's going to get on this state. Oops, right, I'm getting And then it's going to act on the u. But remember the formula I wrote here uh, was u dagger u, uh, grad k u. Now I want, the, uh, I need the grad k u, and that is just u times u. So I need it now because I, when I act with the gradient on this equation, one, one of the terms is going to be the gradient of u. So anyway, I do that and I get this expression here for the gradient of the Vanier interpolated block state. It has two terms because of the two terms over there. And I plug that into the expression for the Berry connection matrix and with a few steps I get this formula here. So there are two terms. One is, and I've removed the band indices just to unclutter things. So these are all matrices. One is ID. Uh, so now I put an I here, an I there, and it kind of looks like a Berry connection, but in terms of the, so this is the tight binding Berry connection if you want. And then there is an additional term where uh, you de be sandwiched between U dagger and U, you have a Berry connection, again, defined in terms of the block basis states not the block eigenstates, so the ones with the W superscript. And you remember what those were, they were given here, uh, in this formula here. So I can just very easily obtain this expression for those matrix elements. So this is very similar to what David showed in the previous talk when he was talking about hybrid finite functions, that you needed matrix elements of the position operator between different hybrid finite functions. So here it's the same, but it's between real Vani functions. And here comes the point where it is useful to use this phase convention that includes so these little tiles there. Uh, the reason is the following, is that remember that when we were talking about the Hamiltonian, I talked about on-site energies and hoppings. So the on-site energies were the diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian in Vanier basis and the hoppings were the off-diagonal ones. So we can use a similar terminology for position matrix elements. So there are also on-site matrix elements which are, which are just the Vanier centers in the home cell. And then there are off-diagonal matrix elements which I can call R hoppings, for example, um, which uh, are given by this expression. And that's precisely what appears here in this equation, okay? So, again, I'm on, writing on top the expression for the Berry connection matrix with those two terms. And uh, uh, the point I want to make is that a very common approximation in tight binding is to discard these R-hopping matrix elements. And so if you do that, this matrix A of W uh, is zero. And so the Berry connection, the Vani interpolated Berry connection matrix reduces to the tight binding one, okay? But when we do Vani interpolation, we don't really need to make this approximation. But um, for example, uh, when Sinisha will talk uh, in a couple of days about Python tight binding, that's the approximation that is done there. So it's kind of nice to see how Vani functions can be used to bridge the tight binding model world that some people are familiar with and the ab initio world. And you can somehow systematically go from one to the other by uh, dropping certain terms. So uh, that's kind of what we're doing here. Okay, so to summarize, um, in Vani interpolation, you always work with small matrices and you do Fourier transforms back and forth. In the case of the energy bands, the matrix elements you need are those of the Hamiltonian. In the case of optical matrix elements, they are uh, Hamiltonian matrix elements and also position matrix elements. And both can be divided into on-site and hopping terms. And sometimes people neglect the hopping terms for the position matrix elements. And we were actually curious to see how good of an approximation that is for real materials. So recently we did 
a calculation on that material I showed before, BC to N, and here's the result. So remember before I showed you how the hopping matrix elements of the Hamiltonian decayed with distance, uh, and I'm showing you something very similar here, but these are now the hopping matrix elements of the position operator. So these are, on the left panel, they are the X component, and on the right panel, they are the Y component. This is a two-dimensional system. And you see that eventually they also drop off very quickly. But actually it's kind of interesting that uh, the first nearest neighbor hoppings are kind of small, then it goes up, and then it goes down again. And uh, so we can calculate the dielectric function that I've, I showed the formula very early on in the talk, and the shift current, so they all depended just on Berry connections and those derivatives, and we can, uh, evaluate them first by completely disregarding these hopping matrix elements of R, so doing what would be a, a tight binding calculation, and then we can progressively bring back the first, second, third nearest neighbor hoppings and see how the calculated optical spectra changes. What you find is that for the linear response, so the linear dielectric function, already the tight binding, the bare tight binding result is basically converged, so when, when you add corrections from uh, hoppings of this R operator, the shape and the, the curve basically doesn't change at all. For the nonlinear response, it's actually a little bit more interesting. It doesn't change a lot, but uh, here in the band edge region, I think you, you, know, you make a kind of a you know, not so small error uh, if you want to be quantitative. And the interesting thing is that when you add, so uh, this solid line is the tight binding result. When you add the first near neighbors, it stays basically the same. But when you add the second nearest neighbors, then you get a, a decisible change. So to get a quantitative uh, uh, kind of uh, um, converged result, you should go up to second nearest neighbors in these R hoppings that are beyond the bare tight binding kind of formula that uh, model people use. So this is kind of a, a cautionary tale that uh, um, there is a little bit more uh, beyond just the simple tight binding description. Okay, how much time do I have? Five minutes, perfect, okay. So uh, I'll go quickly through the procedure. So this was all about optics and I'll talk a little bit about how to do the same uh, strategy to interpolate the Berry curvature for anomalous Hall effects. And really, it's all very similar, but let me first tell you, so remember that Berry curvature was the curl of the diagonal elements of the Berry connection, and if you do a bit of algebra, you arrive at this expression here, so you have, so the Berry connection already had one K derivative, you take a second one, so in the end, you get a formula with two K derivatives, one on the cat, and one on the bra. So uh, when people started evaluating the anomalous cell conductivity of ferromagnets back in 2003, 2004, what they did is they massaged this formula using uh, K dot P perturbation theory, I guess. So we call this the K derivatives formula because it has these K derivatives here, but you can write it as a Kubo or sum over states formula in this form here. And so in the early days, that's what people did. So they implemented uh, within their ab initio codes this sum over states formula where in principle this sum goes over an infinite number of bands, which of course in practice uh, you always truncate. And actually you don't need that many because there is an energy denominator squared. So the Berry curvature of some band N is going to be dominated by the coupling of that band to the nearby bands because that coupling is recently enhanced by this energy denominator squared. But anyway, so people would evaluate with non-self-consistent calculations this Berry curvature over many K points and then evaluate these matrix elements and sum over some number of bands and, until they got convergence. Uh, so uh, what we did uh, is, so 
the reason we got interested in this problem is that in those early calculations, what people found, I will show that later, I should have that slide here, is that to converge those calculations, people needed to evaluate that integral of the Berry curvature. They really, really many, many K points for a metal like iron on the order of millions. And that starts to be quite uh, expensive because it's, uh, in the end, you know, you do a plane wave calculation, even if it's non-self-consistent over a million K points, that's not so easy, and then evaluating all those matrix elements. So our strategy was the following. We don't, uh, we revert from the cube of sum over states formula, we go back to the K derivatives formula. So I've written it here again. And we apply the same Vani interpolation expression that I derived before to evaluate the Berry curvature. And now I just plug it in two places. So for the Berry curvature, I just plug it on the cat. There was only one derivative. Here we do the same, and we just plug it uh, on the bra as well. And we get some formula. I will not write all the terms, but again, there's going to be two types of terms. One just involves this D matrix here. Uh, and the other, uh, so that's kind of the tight binding uh, formula, and the other one has some terms which I'm not writing down, but the point is that if you set to zero those off-diagonal matrix elements of R, like tight binding people do, that term disappears. So in Python tight binding, for example, what you would implement is uh, the first term there. Um, but again, in post W90 or in Vanier Berry, uh, when you do any interpolation of the Berry curvature, like in the tutorial uh, later, there is this first term and then the other terms I didn't write down. But so the first term uh, uh, is basically like a Kubo formula, and I'm calling it the tight binding Kubo formula, because D, if you remember, it has this expression I wrote a few slides ago, and it looks basically like the Kubo formula because these U dagger U's are the tight binding eigenvectors, and this gradient of K of the Hamiltonian matrix the, is the velocity matrix element, essentially. And we have two Ds, and so we're going to get an energy denominator squared. So the point is that uh, when you do any interpolation, the sum over bands is only a sum over the finite number of bands that you've vanierized. But the funny thing is that you're not making any truncation error on the bands because somehow it all magically works out that the terms that you left out from the bands that you didn't vanierize, they magically show up uh, like in the R hopping terms. But so there is really no band tru truncation in these Vani interpolation expressions, which is kind of uh, satisfying. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I will skip this. It's just to say that uh, w uh, to calculate the normal cell conductivity, you sum the Berry curvature over the occupied state, and then that total Berry curvature only reacts strongly to the difference in energy between the occupied and the empty states, and uh, it does not react strongly to small uh, energy denominators or band crossings am among the occupied states. And so I'm showing you here a plot this is now iron magnetized along Z, so we need the Berry curvature summed over the occupied states, the Z component. And this is the band structure of iron along some high symmetry lines. The top panel is the bands. Here's the Fermi level. And what you see is that, when, like for example here, when the Fermi level cuts through a pair of bands, so one of them is just below and the other is just above the Fermi level, then when that happens, you get a huge spike in the Berry curvature because of those energy denominator squareds. And so that's why this is such a tricky uh, quantity to calculate. Uh, you need to somehow zoom in on these regions of K space. And in fact, these spikes are not even all along high symmetry lines. Here is a heat map on a plane, and you see that uh, on these... Uh, regions where two Fermi uh, contours approach each other, there is like a hot spot of large and positive Berry curvature, that's the red color. And here, again, two Fermi lines are very close to each other and there is a hot spot of negative Berry curvature. So you have to capture all this stuff. And so it's a perfect problem for Vani interpolation. And that was really the motivation back in 2006, 2007 with, 
David, uh, Jonathan Yates, and David Student, uh, Chinji Wang, that uh, got us thinking about using finite functions to do, to make basically K points cheap. And this was released in Vanier 90 eventually as part of the post W19 mo module. And more recently, many other properties have been, uh, this kind of methodology has been applied to many other berry type quantities. I've listed a few here, including orbital magnetization that David mentioned. And okay, uh, I'll just leave this slide uh, for the end where kind of to, uh, to um, hand over to Stepan and the tutorial because Stepan wrote this uh, wonderful code, Vani Berry, that uh, has many very clever optimizations. And uh, uh, I list here some of the features that he has implemented and that you will see in today's uh, tutorial. So thank you very much. Any questions? Maybe online? Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I'm myself also in like between this Abinitia and type binding world, so while working on this, I always like came up with some like questions about uh, the if I'm doing things right, and I always see or tend to see that you usually do like a one shot procedure in in when you are doing the binarization, mm -hmm. and I get that you are getting a really good physical insight, but you have some pre established or you have some uh, physical uh, intuition behind this. And I wanted to ask then, like, if I have uh, maybe not uh, really good uh, physical intuition about the material, and then I do a vanarization, uh, a disentanglement process, uh, procedure, and then a vanarization, how uh, are these results good? Or how would you, like, apply your, uh, what you do to these results? To which extent is better to do a one-shot procedure rather to do a full vanarization? And as a last question also, you think, uh, is it possible to do like some kind of symmetrization of this Hamiltonian after doing this uh, vanarization? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, so let me start with the second question. I think uh, Stepan will, may mention that because I think that's a recent feature in uh, Vanier Berry. So yes, definitely you can do that. You can either symmetrize the Hamiltonian a posteriori uh, or uh, maybe even better, I think you can do some symmetrization before setting up the, the matrix elements. But I think uh, maybe Stefan will. Do, do you want to add something? Or? Uh, well, there are three, actually. So there are actually three uh, ways uh, at which stage you can do it. One is uh, that you keep symmetry uh, during uh, your vanierization, which is the called the symmetry adapted vanier functions, which also there is a tutorial later, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, second, uh, when you constructed your vanier functions, but they are slightly asymmetric, uh, if you did a one shot, then you can really restore the symmetry. So you symmetrize your Hamiltonian and also this position element matrix is, and uh, whatever you have, and you get a now a symmetric model. And third, uh, you can just uh, calculate with whatever you have, and uh, like when you integrate uh, the, uh, the, in the case space, and you get your tensors or vectors or whatever quantities, like anomalous hole, conductivities, and others, and you just symmetrize uh, the resulting tensor, just a posteriori. So the second and third uh, are implemented in Vanier Berry, so in the first, is in one year 90. Well, with some limitations, but uh, we will know it later. So maybe I can uh, comment a little bit on your first question. So uh, the philosophy here is that we use Vanier functions as a basis. So if the basis is good in some sense, the results should be, uh, for the physical observables, should be independent of the basis that you choose. The way it works out in Vani interpolation is that you remember I wrote these formulas that contain several terms, 
And what happens is that you go, if you go from a set of any functions, for example, the projected ones, the one-shot projection, to the maximally localized of any functions, there is going to be a change basically in bookkeeping. So the values of the individual terms will change, but the net result should be basically the same as long as the Vani functions are somehow good, which in practice means well localized. So the message is as long as they are well localized, it shouldn't really matter. Of course, if you want to build models, uh, you probably want to keep the atomic picture and that's why uh, many times uh, re in, you know, people you do the one-shot projection depending on what they want to do later. But for the purpose of funny interpolation, it shouldn't really matter as long as they are fairly well localized. Maybe I can say something of this. There is one special case that is time reversal symmetry. So sometimes if, you know, when you study it with spin orbit, a system that has, has time reversal symmetry, and, and the one-year functions that you construct, often they are not perfectly time reverse symmetric. The interpolation can be tricky, you know. The bands that should be degenerate cannot be degenerate. Well, right, and this comes back to the other question, which yeah. was symmetrizing the results, because, right, so you can, it's a bit annoying when you have these slight symmetry breakings in your band, and, yeah. Okay, Itch. any questions from Zoom? One, yes. Is it possible to calculate the Berry curvature in real space? Yes. Ah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, should yes. I answer? You? Yes, no, you, you should answer, answer, but the answer is yes. Uh, okay, do you want to answer? <laughs> so you mean like the, the, um, these things about non-collinear spin textures? Uh, Yeah. What was the question? Is it possible to calculate the Berry curvature in real space? So, yes, yeah, certainly all I've talked about for the purpose of this presentation was the case space Berry curvature. Uh, if I understand correctly the question, I think indeed one can define Berry curvatures uh, in other spaces, including in real space. And they, in fact, they also contribute to an anomalous all effect in systems with nonlinear spins. But to be honest, I've never really thought about uh, how you would go about using Vani functions. So maybe that. I misinterpreted the questions because I thought, you know, he was asking if you can calculate. Oh, the, like the mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, right. okay. So this, they say the intrinsic anomalous conductivity in a, in a metal uh, in real space. And this is something that uh, we did, Rafael. And even before, Rafael Lobianco did the work for, uh, you know, the, the, the chair number in real space. So. You know, if, right. if the, you, I don't know if the participant meant that, but if that was the question, the answer is yes. Maybe you're right. Maybe Both for metals and insulators. Yeah. 